What's your percent of success? What what so far? I know seven years been doing this. What are what are your sort of ballpark success? What do you think? I mean, uh, our so when you look at the uh, man, I would have brought my data with me and we could have done it. But when you look at like this employee wellness cohort, because I think that's the safest way to seventy five people I didn't know, and now one hundred and you know two, almost two hundred people I didn't know. Right? They didn't pick me. And if you look at those people, the average weight loss at a year was fifteen percent. At two years, I suspect it dropped to, to about 12. I mean, we, ha- we haven't calculated that data yet, but it's coming in. Probably going to be between 12 and 15%. So I think we could keep weight off for two years. But that's when struggles hit over the long term. And one family, they lost their house. Another one, the daughter moved back in, and she's a cook. And, you know, uh, another one that had a you know death in the family. So you have to account for these things. So I think will probably at two years be somewhere definitely double digits weight loss maintained off you know 10 10 to 15 you know it'll be like 13 or 14 percent i'd imagine um and our attrition rate is surprisingly low you know uh in this voluntary program where they don't have to pay the employees they don't have to pay the employer pays us uh the the you know less than 15% 15% leave, and a lot of those are because they left the company. So, but we are highly selective, right? So they have to be ready to change. They have to have metabolic, severe metabolic disease. Uh, we're screening them up front. Uh, so it's not, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's generalizable. You know, we, we are, if somebody calls us and says, I want to lose 10 pounds for my wedding next week, like they're not, they're not coming in. You know, this is a long term program you know, that your employer pays for, and you have to be a steward of that, and we have to be a steward of their resources. So so we're trying to make sure people are serious. So yeah, very low attrition rate, but we are so selective. You know, they have to do stuff. They have to want to be there. Yeah, and why, you know, the, 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 so that's not fair. You know, like Ozempic, you can give it to anybody. It's easy prescription for them, right? Yeah, so I think, you know, if if, So if you have somebody who's not ready to change, you know, they're truly not ready to change. They're going through intense stress. Their father's dying. I don't know, something like that, right? And they're not going to be able, they're going to be like, maybe that's the person that these drugs are for, right? You, you, but the problem is, is I don't think most doctors know how to even, so we, we even published our results tapering GLP-1 drugs. So you'll see in this paper that we published, we tapered on a cohort of patients, GLP, and how we perform. I won't give away the results, but you'll see it in our paper. Um, so we walked through the tapering and our weight loss results. And I'm sure you can imagine if it was bad, I'm not sure I would be looking to publish it, but you know, the other groups have shown that you can maintain weight off while tapering these drugs. You know, there was a, there was a cohort in, uh, exor- in patients who exercised, uh, were given exercise regimen, they were able to taper without uh, weight uh, regain, and then Verda Health, which is a you know virtual uh, low carb intervention, they were also able to show uh, tapering GLPs without weight regain. And if you looked at the original step trials, they all had weight regain in the uh, in the group that discontinued the medication. That's awesome. Sorry, I talk that, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm going to pull that paper. I think that's great. Is it published yet or is it pending? So we just submitted so, uh, okay. in the editor's hands now. Okay. I would love to read uh, that. In yeah. the, uh, what you're talking about, Dr. Tro, is really flies in the face, as you mentioned at the beginning, of really everything we learned in med school, uh, the whole calorie model of obesity. Can you talk a little bit about that and why we keep harping on cut the calories, get to the gym and, you know, and of course exercise is important. We all know that, but this is what you're talking about is, is quite a bit different than the convention. The calories model, uh, the energy balance model, it's a tautology. It doesn't, it doesn't quite make sense. So like, let me give you an example, right. On, on how it's very hard to, uh, you know, there's, there's this idea, which is probably true, which is if you eat less, you'll lose weight, right? Okay. And the idea is that you create a caloric deficit, 
okay? You, you're creating a deficit and that's the cause of weight loss, right? You, you ingest a certain amount of carbon, Okay, and you eventually break it down, you pee out the H2O and you breathe out the carbon dioxide, right? Those carbons went somewhere and you release heat and this is how uh, energy happens. But I don't think it's exactly uh, exactly how we're taught. And I'll give you just a quick example, right? Um, you know, uh, metformin causes you to lose weight, a very modest weight reduction couple pounds causes weight reduction. Do you know how it does that? I think it affects what, what liver, it decreases what liver gluconeogenesis, I think. Oh, that's all the bullshit, right? That's the bullshit. <laughs> so we didn't know until, until this year and the GI doc will immediately know, right? What does every patient with takes metformin tell you? you have diarrhea? Diarrhea. It causes, so they labeled glucose and gave it to patients with metformin. And glucose was excreted in the jejunum and the, and the ileum, particularly the terminal ileum. It causes glucose. It makes you shit out glucose. It literally makes you shit out glucose. I don't know if that's the primary mechanism, but it's something we learned in the past four years. Okay. So how does that affect calories? You're losing calories in the shit. Right? When you're ketotic, you lose ketones in the urine. You breathe it out. Your mitochondria uncouple. They get less sufficient. When you ingest protein, some of it is a big portion of it is converted to heat. So the problem with the caloric model is it's just it's a non we're looking at something, we're trying to look at something linearly. And it's very complicated, right? And and I gave a quick calculation with Matt Walsh on Twitter. We're going back and forth arguing uh, on how you can actually eat more calories and lose weight. And this was recently shown in 2021. David Ludwig showed that if you maintain your calories, uh, your carbohydrates low, calorie controlled, and weight controlled, that you'll spontaneously burn 200 more calories in a day. Don't know where that goes. We know with increasing protein that you lose energy to heat, right? By about 20%. So I demonstrated a way calorically that you could eat 300 calories more and lose weight, right? And this is the problem with calories, and that's just a rough guess, you know, guesstimation. So, uh, and if you look at, you know, how, who does this model really, well, did it, didn't have an impact. We've known about calories for years. And if you look at, you know, calories at the point of purchase, calories on menus, calories uh, on the back of labels, none of this affects eating behavior. In fact, in unrestrained eaters, it may cause more eating, to be honest with you. Now, some of the studies showed that. So it doesn't impact human behavior in any way. It is failed to, it is a real world failure, meaning that this information is nearly ubiquitous and there's no end in sight to the obesity epidemic. Um, so I think it's just a failed, it was a good idea, it was a good try, you know, but it didn't work, right? So, uh, and it's, it's not as linear as we make it out to be. And to be honest, who benefits it shifts the blame also to the to the patient. It's if you can't regulate this addictive calories, the problem's on you, right? And that's not exactly true, right? Like take and you know, there was a picture that I showed at a recent lecture I did of me and my wife. We both changed our diets about ten years ago. I lost 150 pounds. She lost 20 pounds. So we respond, we're at the opposite ends of the spectrum on how an addictive food environment affects our biology, right? She lost 20 pounds, I lost 150 pounds. Her migraines went away, disappeared, severe lifelong migraines. That's in the literature, by the way. I wouldn't have thought that. Ketogenic diet improves migraines. So 
the addictive food environment, it's, it's sort of like alcohol. Not everybody has an alcohol problem. We know certain people will develop an alcohol problem, you know. Uh, so when it comes to that calories model, it's sort of like saying, you know, you're to blame if you have alcohol. It's not, yes, it's true. You're the only one who could be responsible for your alcohol intake. But we know it's an addictive substance and certainly some people. So I think the people who struggle the most with food, they're more likely to have food addiction binge eating, right? Which is more than just calories, uh, which is more than just calories. So I think as a basis for understanding obesity, it, it, you know, the best way I could say it, it's like somebody said to you, you know, you go to the doctor, you're like, I have a flat tire. And the doctor's like, well, you just need to pump more air in than you let out. It's true. If you pump more air in than you let out, your flat tire will be fixed. But it's not really helpful in any way. It's a true statement. It's like, I'm gonna, I want to build a plane, Doc. Well, you need more lift than gravity. You know, that's calories. You know, that's, it's, it's a true statement that doesn't seem to help anybody. And it's a lot more complex than I think, uh, you know, than, than most people respect. Uh, and I think it's a real world failure. You know, it's a real, if it, if it worked, you know, you would have hoped that with this ubiquitous sort of uptake of calorie information and calorie trackers, we have over a billion downloads of calorie trackers. You know, and it's just, it's, you know, it's sort of like in the middle of a pandemic when I saw all the masks in the trails around my house, I wish it worked. I wish it worked to solve the problem that it was intended to, but it didn't, you know, uh, but it didn't. Whether, you know, we're not doing it good enough or whether it's a, not a great model for, I don't know. I don't know why it didn't work, but it didn't work. What do you think the food industry knows this enhancing the taste and enhancing the binge eating? What's, what's your thoughts on the, you know, the sodas and fast food that they know the craving of the humans and they just keep, um, you know, it's everywhere. I mean, you go down the street, there's nothing but fast food. And I see a lot of my employees, my patients, they just cannot stop, you know, going there. Well, you know who else knew? Uh, You said you're from Tehran, right? So Iran. So uh, when my uh, my grandmother was from the same area, it was probably where your grandmother was from. Okay, they take um, cracked wheat. They take wheat, right, and then they put uh, uh, they make a um, they put butter in it, right, and they know how to make it amazing. I would never eat cracked wheat, but you put butter and cracked wheat together, and I would eat a lot of it. It would make rice pilaf, right? I won't eat it, but they put butter in it and it tastes amazing, right? They take filo dough and they put rose water and sugar, right? And all of a sudden we're eating pachlava, right? So our grandmothers knew how to make food better, right? There's a dish in uh, that comes from the Iranian border uh, of Armenia It's called Keros of Kebab. It's it's literally they take the ground meat and they soak it in the cherries during cherry season, right? And it's like uh, it's like kebab soaked in cherries, right? And it's yeah, and it's amazing. It's an amazing dish, right? It's an amazing dish. And what do they do with the the raw meat? They mix it with bulgur, fatty meat. They mix it with bulgur. I don't know, do you guys do kebesini or what? I don't know what you what do you guys call it. You know the the uh, they mix the fat and the carbohydrate, which is the ultimate reward for the brain. The brain will take rice, it'll take bread, but how do you eat more bread? You add butter, you add oil, uh, and then you add sugar and salt. Sugar is uniquely addictive. Salt is a potentiator. Right, uh, and you have something amazing, right? And if you look at all the foods, pizza, 
is probably the most addictive food. Ice cream and chocolate are second and third. Fourth is cookie cake. Fifth is chips and fries, right? They're all carb-fat combinations, right? Plus or minus sweet, plus or minus uh, uh, salt, right? So uh, the model is very easy, you know? It's very easy. And then flavor variation is another trick they use. Uh, where every chip is a different flavor first, you know, some has less, some has more. So they use even more advanced tricks. Um, but, but the, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty easy formula, you know, and our grandmothers knew it, right? So do I blame the food companies? No, I blame doctors for not explaining to patients more than calories. Right. I mean, what am I going to blame my grandma and your grandma for making food that tasted good for us? Well, that's what we did. It was not no food or or they eat seasonally, not like in here that would be abundant 24 hour foods, you know, and excess. Yeah. Yes. 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 I think, you know, I, I think that glow, you know, sort of global commerce and, and profit driven major industries, you know, will exploit any avenue they have. Right. If you look at um, the supermarket aisles, you know, even when I was a kid, there were half, the uh, cereal aisle was half as long, half as many varieties. Chip aisle, same thing, right? Um, the McDonald's menu had four items, or five items. You know, now there's like, it's endless. So um, yes, it's not just you versus your willpower. It is you versus a team of, food scientists, marketers, you know, they are going to win. This is a casino and the house always wins, right? And you have to, you have to know that. But did the casino start with? No, I mean, we gambled before there were casinos, you know? Uh, so I, you know, people ask me, do I support, uh, right? You know, we're, we're working on the committee now to get uh, ultra processed food addiction recognized and they asked me do i support regulation i said no you know i don't i don't support regulation you know i support educating i you know talking with two docs that's what i support so then another 100 docs could hear this you know and they can go talk to a thousand patients each you know? so i think you know when we talk about the companies I think they do have a responsibility, you know, but, and we have companies that are sort of playing the opposite side, you know, Quest is, you know, I'm not promoting, I don't have any stock in Quest, right? But they make high protein chips, you know? So if you're, if you have a chip problem, you could switch to a low carb, high protein chip, you know, uh, they make, um, you know, they have a low carb breads now. I mean, they taste like shit, but I mean, like if you toast them, they're not so bad. Right. Um, and ultimately, you know, uh, meat and vegetables, you know, if you, and if it's, that's expensive, I mean, you can really find some things on sale. There's frozen vegetables on sale, frozen berries on sale, uh, that you can get and you can get, you know, uh, family packed meats that are you know cheapest, so it's it's accessible. You could batch cook, you know. So I think um, I think we have to educate. We have to be careful. You know, like there's some industries out there trying to do. You know, there's uh, you know it's funny. I went to Obesity Week, the biggest conference for obesity medicine, and I'm very critical. And they were sponsored by Coca Cola. There was a, a thing of Coca Cola there. And I took a picture and I said, this is embarrassing that, you know, I'm at obesity week and there's a tray of Coca-Cola here. And the, uh, one of the lead dietitians from Coca-Cola came, uh, and found me and said, um, that, uh, why am I against them? I said, I'm not against you. I just don't think we should be having you here. You know, he said, well, we're trying to help. You know, we have seltzers and diet products. Said, We're trying to help. That's what they said. And uh, she said, we can, we can help you do research. 
they also send. We can help you. We can fund better research. That's what she said. So you make it that what you will. Uh, the conversation ended there. But, uh, but um, I don't think, you know, I think uh, as time goes on also, the, the, and as we educate more, you know, people will look for alternatives. Look at smoking. You know, you have Philip Morris, you have these big companies, and, uh, you know, with a bit of regulation and a bit of education, we were able to make some huge changes. Now it's gone to vaping, unfortunately. Um, but uh, that's, I think, one area of success. So maybe a combination of education and then just a bit of, you know, maybe taxation. I don't know. I, I prefer the education component. Do you support uh, warning labels on foods like they do? I think it's in like uh, Sri Lanka. They'll label it and it says, uh, you know, this product basically is sugar is addictive. Or in, I was in Mexico recently. Is a big big stop sign. It says excessive azure, or sh- or sh- probably mispronouncing that, but excessive sugar in the product, any, anything like that as a means to educate people about the contents of that package? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, sugar is addictive. You know, sugar, full, full stop. Processed carbs are addictive, you know. You can potentiate that signal by adding fat and salt, you know. But sugar itself is addictive. Processed carbs in itself are addictive. Um, and that's 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 the real problem with the, it's a poly substance. If you really want to get fancy, you'll add caffeine, you know. Put some, you know, they put the green leaf, green tea extract and coffee extract now in food. You know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. There's a reason why there's a Starbucks everywhere. You know, do you, have you ever seen the amount of sugar in one of those Starbucks drinks? It's it's insane. We we have one in Colorado called Dutch Brothers, and uh, we our our daughter brought brought the nutrition label back, and uh, some of those. Yeah, drinks have over a thousand calories in them and they're just loaded. It's all sugar calories. Um, yeah, it's, it's, inc- it's absolutely incredible. Um, how much is in that just one, one drink and, uh, you drink it and it's, you know, it's a big drink, but still it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think folks realize there's quite that much in there. And I, I think people need to understand also coming back to that calories point, you know, when you're looking at a drink like that, um, uh, you have to realize it actually depletes all blood energy right so when you have high insulin in response to high sugar right it depletes free fatty acids glucose right it brings your ketones to zero right so you will have a start a drop in total blood energy within one and a half hours so you are literally starving every organ of energy when you have this food. It is a very potent storage signal. And then you crave more. And then you crave more, correct. And this was shown in a big cohort of 80,000 meals over 1,000 patients that these blood sugar fluctuations increase hunger, predict weight gain, predict uh, uh, food intake. And David Ludwig showed that it literally, he showed what I'm alluding to, which is that it robs your blood of energy. Uh, and this has been shown. Total body energy is decreased after high insulin, high carb. Uh, so if you want to go into a food coma and be starving, it's a great. Or if you're looking to send, you know, uh, carbohydrates into muscle tissue, you know, that's a great way. And fat tissue simultaneously, while lowering your IQ, you know, it's a, it's a, that's a that part was a joke. But uh, the rest is true, you know. <laughs> but uh, but that's uh, that's the way to do it, you know. With a thousand calorie, three hundred gram a carb, two hundred fifty gram carb drink. Do you advocate fasting in any way? Just that I, I would just add a, just uh, is there any fasting in your program or is not not at all? Uh, yeah, after hunger subsides, that usually takes like two months, you know. So you can. Uh, Interestingly, you can actually get a sense of your organ utilization of ketones when your uric acid excretion normalizes. So, um, so your body uh, it takes to make peak fat oxidation 
uh, takes about two weeks, a week to two weeks, probably 10 days. Your body to utilize ketones, uh, it's not very well known when peak ketone utilization is, right? And so, um, but we, we have surrogates to determine that. So, so ketones compete for the same channel for excretion with uric acid. So um, when you're ketotic, the way to estimate the, uh, the body's ketone utilization, which is organ usage of ketones, would be when the uric acid normalizes, probably month two to three. Uh, or when the uric, uric acid excretion decreases. So, so sorry for the listener if this is too geeky, but um, so that usually happens around month two. That clinically coincides with, Doc, I'm not hungry anymore. What's going on? You know, Doc, the voices in to eat are gone. You know, um, I suspect the blood sugar stabilizing is a key portion of that, but then also I suspect this ketone utilization is some some part of it. So we we push fasting, so to speak, you know, months somewhere around week six to eight, more than anything else. And it's just simply delay your meal. If you're not hungry, delay your meal. That's the message. Now, for me personally, in a given week, most of my practice, most of the people there more than a year are eating somewhere between seven to 12 meals a week. You know, most people. Um, if their exercise volume is higher, they may be closer to 14. And if the exercise volume is low, it'll be closer to seven. And that's based on their own subjective hunger signals. We tell them to fast as they see comfortable. Uh, a big hunger signal comes around three o'clock, which is after the cortisol rise, there's a dip and like the nadir of blood sugar during the day is somewhere between three and five. That's when most people will look to initiate a meal. I don't know if that's a social cue, a, a physiologic cue or both. Sorry, guys. If I'm too geeky, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's you know? no. it's beautiful. Do you think fasting during the day versus at night make any difference or no? So, so I've looked at the Ramadan data. I've looked at the Ramadan data. I've looked at the early versus late fasting data. I think... Um, the only detriment to late fasting is in the sleep disturbance. That's my my personal theory. So, so there seems to be a signal that early fasting, early eating windows are are slightly better for insulin sensitivity and weight loss. So having like a let's say a eight to twelve window versus like a two to six window. We certainly know that eight hours and six hours aren't too different six hours and four hours slight superiority to four hours so four hours definitely better than eight hours for weight loss um and that makes sense the fed state is like three to five hours right so you know you're, you're not going to eat a lot within the you know within the fed state like it's just rate limited oh man if i'm is this like more like if this is lay audience so fed state guys is like when you eat and your stomach is like primed to keep the food in the stomach, you know, the pylorus closes so you can digest food. So that process usually takes three to five hours. Yeah, in GI physiology, at least in me, when the people, they eat too much at night and they fast during the morning, then I of course the reflux, then acid, and yeah, still that disturbs sleep. Worse. So, just, so that's yeah, all yeah, sleep. Yeah. So that all plays into sleep disturbance. So, so here's the, here, we'll, we'll, walk, we'll walk that to the end. So if you fast, if you have a big meal late, then you end up eating a big meal late. When you have the big meal late, you get more reflux and you get poor quality sleep, just whether you have reflux or not, but more likely to have reflux late at night. And when you get poor quality of sleep, hormonally, you will have higher ghrelin the entire next day. You'll have higher ghrelins post meals the entire next day. And uh, you, and and that sleep disturbance, even one hour sleep di disturbance, spontaneously increases caloric intake up to about 200 to 300 calories. So I think the real detriment to late fasting is if it's too late and too large. 
So, you know, if you're going to do uh, uh, like a 12 to 5 or something, make sure it's 5. Or just get your big meal at 12 and make the, make the dinner meal small. So those would be my options. But it's very hard. Pragmatically speaking, socially speaking, we're anchored to dinner. So it's very difficult to tell somebody to skip. If I try to skip dinner, my kids and my wife are going to be like, what are you, where are you? You know, what are you doing? <laughs> That's the you social know? hour in America. That's exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's tough. So what's your take home message? You know, give us like a synopsis as of what you think and what we should, our audience to know. And um, so just give us, give us a little summary of what's, you know, I, you have a beautiful story and you have a lot of evidence. Um, so if somebody wants to, you know, take care of themselves, just give us some a sort of conclusion or a summary, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to give it in one sentence. Don't eat food that makes you eat more. That's it. Don't eat food that makes, if a food makes you eat more, avoid it. If a food makes you full for a really long time, and you don't want to eat for a really long time after it, keep eating it. Keep eating that food. That's probably the best like single one line statement. And if you struggled your whole life, stop looking for a diet plan, a diet plan to solve your mental health and your stress. You know, don't look to nutrition. Your plate cannot fix your mindset, right? And your psychology. So you have to, you can't keep looking to the macro amount or calorie amount to solve serious life problems. Most serious life problems need help, you know, get help. And it's, it's attainable, very simple, you know, address your hunger, cravings, feelings of deprivation, manage your social situations, manage your emotions, outline your problem, foods, places, people, situations, immediately recover. Beautiful. Yeah, I think that's a great place to sum up. And Dr. Shaw, thank you so much. You've been uh, ultra gracious with your time. We so appreciate it. Our listeners do as well. How can our listeners find you? And are you by any chance, license in Colorado or California? Uh, both. I think both. I think both. California, definitely. But I'm not taking many more patients. So uh, it'll, but our practice is taking patients. You know, uh, there's a team is awesome. Dr. Laura Buchanan, Mary Duganzik, and we have four amazing health coaches, each who have their own health journeys, personal trainer. So yeah, they can call up uh, or text, they can text our practice, email our practice. You know, just visit the website, drtro.com, spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-T-R-O.com. We have a free app, free podcast, Low Carb MD podcast, all social. Wonderful. I greatly appreciate your time. It's been really an honor talking to you. And if you ever come this side of Colorado or California, let's get together. We'd love to learn more from you. Same here. Well, I'll be there. I'll be there. In, I'll be not too far, you know, not too far in September. I'll send my information. Give me a text. We'll get together. All right. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for staying up. Thank you.